Welcome to Witch Hunt Podcast Victim Stories. I'm Salem Witch Trial Descendant, Sarah Jack. The men and women convicted of witchcraft in the American colonies were not occult practitioners or witches in the sense that modern culture often imagines. They were ordinary people, unjustly accused, and completely innocent of the charges brought against them. The Victim Stories podcast series gives them a voice, allowing us to share who they truly were and what they faced. During the 1692 Salem Witch Hunt, more than 170 people from Essex County and surrounding towns were accused of practicing witchcraft. 19 were hanged. Giles Corey refused to stand trial and was pressed to death, and at least five perished in the jails. Among those unjustly convicted were Martha Carrier, George Jacob Sr., George Burroughs, John Willard, and John Proctor, who were all hanged on August 19, 1692. These five individuals were not witches, but innocent people caught in a tragic and unjust situation. In his publication, More Wonders of the Invisible World, Robert Califf gives us a vivid recounting of this execution. We have details that only go back to the source, but we do have some examination records that give us the words of these individuals. Let's look closer at who George Jacob Sr. was. George Jacob Sr., the oldest victim of the Salem witch trials, is a particularly poignant figure. His family was deeply entangled in the events, leading to significant disruption and turmoil. Described in contemporary accounts as a tall man with long white hair and no teeth, George was afflicted by something severe like arthritis and used two wooden canes for his mobility. He owned a large farm known as Northfields, situated to the north of Salem Town, roughly halfway to Salem Village. Starting with 10 acres in 1658, Jacobs and his family expanded their land significantly over the years. His house stood for over 250 years after the trials, until it was tragically destroyed by lightning in the 1930s. Fortunately, the house was thoroughly documented as part of the New Deal projects, including photographs of both the interior and exterior before it was removed around 1940. In 1692, George had remarried and his 17-year-old granddaughter, Margaret Jacobs, lived with him. His son, George Jacobs Jr. and his wife, Rebecca, sister of Daniel Andrews from Salem Village, were Margaret's parents. They lived nearby along with neighbors Daniel Andrews and Peter and Sarah Cloyce. Sarah Cloyce faced unimaginable tragedy when her sisters, Rebecca Nurse and Mary Esty, were executed for witchcraft in 1692. It's interesting to note a little-known detail about the homesteads of some of the Salem witch trial victims. Before victim Rebecca Nurse married Frances Nurse and her family relocated to Topsfield, the town family lived in the same area where the Jacobs family later settled. George Jacobs moved into the neighborhood only after the town had left. According to Dan Gagnon's research, the town family's house was kitty corner to the future Jacobs residence, adding to the historical significance of the area. Connecticut State Historian Emeritus Walt Woodward notes in his book, Prospero's America, that John Winthrop Jr.'s salt house was located at the junction of the Bass and Danvers Rivers, near the present-day location of Winthrop Street and Jacob Street. George was accused by the older of the afflicted young girls, whose accusations, despite their youth, carried significant weight. Despite the weak evidence, their testimonies heavily influenced the trial's outcome. Sarah Churchill, a 25-year-old servant, was the first to accuse Jacob Sr. of witchcraft, claiming she suffered convulsion. As one of the several household servants and enslaved persons who accused others during the Salem witch trials, Churchill's accusations against the head of her household were taken seriously. Thomas Putnam's servant, Marcy Lewis, also accused the specter of George Jacob Sr. of assaulting her, while Mary Warren, who worked for the Proctors, testified that she witnessed Jacob Sr. Spectre beating Sarah Churchill at Ingersoll's Ordinary. Additionally, neighbor Mary Walcott claimed she, too, had been beaten by Jacob Sr. Spectre. In reality, Jacobs was severely afflicted by arthritis. He was accused by Ann Putnam Jr., Abigail Williams, Mary Walcott, Marcy Lewis, and Elizabeth Hubbard, all of whom testified against both Jacobs and his granddaughter, Margaret. Now confessing to witchcraft herself, Margaret, believing she could save herself by admitting guilt, also implicated her grandfather. Sarah Churchill was examined at the village meeting house at May night. Fearing for her life, she confessed to making a pact with the devil and accused her employer, George Jacobs Sr., along with his son, George Jacobs Jr., and his granddaughter, Margaret, of practicing witchcraft. On May 10th, George Jacobs Sr. and his granddaughter, Margaret, were arrested and taken to Salem Town. At some point, George Jacobs Jr., father of Margaret fled. 
Jacob Sr. was examined at Thomas Beadle's Tavern, where he expressed astonishment at the accusations of witchcraft against him. Remember those accusations of spectral beatings? This was accepted as evidence that he was a witch. George Jacob Sr. stood resolutely against the charges. He delivered some of the most memorable lines of the trials in response to the magistrate's questions, all while the afflicted girls put on a spectacle around him. He said, you tax me for a wizard, you might as well tax me for a buzzard. I have done no harm. He never confessed. He declared, I am as innocent as the child born tonight, and told the magistrates he was as innocent as they were. He was also the one who said, well, burn me or hang me, I will stand in the truth of Christ. I know nothing of it. George Jacobs Sr. was one of the first to challenge the idea that the devil could only take the form of a guilty witch, suggesting instead that the devil could assume any form. His insight questioned the very basis of some of the witchcraft accusations. Sarah Churchill later recanted after George Jacobs' conviction, but before his hanging date. Yet, it made no difference. He was still hanged. It's relatable to see how differently family members reacted when faced with charges. The Jacobs family exhibited the full range of fight, flight, or freeze responses, reactions we can all understand when under pressure. When George Jacobs Sr. was accused, tried, and executed, his family had to cope with the devastating impact of these events. His granddaughter, Margaret Jacobs, was particularly affected. In a dramatic turn of events, she ultimately testified against her own grandfather, adding a tragic twist to the family's ordeal. The witch hunt didn't stop with George Jacobs Sr. and Margaret. Margaret's parents, George Jr. and Rebecca Jacobs, were both accused. George Jacobs Jr. chose to flee, while Rebecca Jacobs was arrested at the house. Despite Sarah Churchill's recantation, George Jacobs Sr. was still hanged. We know that George's granddaughter, Margaret, recanted her accusation against Reverend George Burroughs and visited him in the jail to apologize. She could have encountered her grandfather, whom she had also testified against. When Margaret's grandfather rewrote his will, he decided to write Margaret back into his will at the very last moment. Author Dan Gagnon highlights in his writings that even as these individuals face death, they retain the authority to dictate their wishes regarding the distribution of their property and personal artifacts. This remaining power is a significant statement of their agency and resilience in the face of overwhelming adversity. George Jacob Sr. endured his trial with fortitude and went to his death like the other 18 who were hanged, maintaining his innocence. We learned when interviewing author Dan Gagnon that perhaps the most interesting aspect is what happens after his death in 1692. He is not remembered until March of 1992, when the Salem Village Memorial finally includes his name. This marks the first time his name is carved on any stone in his memory. In examining his case, it becomes evident that Rebecca Nurse, who was the first to be memorialized, serves as a stark contrast. He remained unrecognized for 300 years. In a previous Witch Hunt episode, Dan Gagnon shared that it is believed Jacobs was originally buried on his farm, situated at the north edge of what was known as the North Fields in Salem. He lived next to the farm where Rebecca Nurse grew up, though they did not live there simultaneously. Today, this area is part of Danversport, along the border with Peabody, with his farm essentially marking the boundary. Jacob's body was buried in a corner of his fields without a headstone or marker. The location was well known to his family and the neighborhood. He was not buried next to a family member or in a family cemetery, but alone in the field. In 1854, his body was exhumed for the first time when the field was sold. The new owner had heard about Jacob's burial and wanted to verify it. Upon finding the bones and hair, they reburied him in the same spot. He would be exhumed twice in total, each time under different circumstances. After Jacob's was reburied, he remained undisturbed for about a hundred years. Allegedly, a finger was removed from Jacob's body and kept in a glass bottle by Samuel Fowler, a local historian in Danversport. As part of the New Deal's projects, the Historic American Building Survey thoroughly documented the Jacobs House, capturing photographs of both the interior and exterior. Fortunately, this documentation occurred before the house was struck by lightning and burned down in the 1930s, leaving only a shell. It was then removed around 1940, according to the closest available date. It is truly tragic how it ended, having stood for over 250 years after the trials. There is a stark contrast between his burial and memorialization compared to someone like Rebecca Nurse's burial and memorialization. The artifacts of George Jacobs Sr., including his canes and possibly his bones, 
have been relocated multiple times over the centuries. They have been buried, dug up, reburied, and moved between storage and exhibits. Today, he has a burial stone in the burying ground at the Rebecca Nurse Homestead. And author Dan Gagnon has published and presented the details of George Jacob's legacy in the article, Skeletons in the Closet, How the Actions of the Salem Witch Trials Victims' Families in 1692 Affected Later Memorialization, which was published in the New England Journal of History in 2019. George Jacob Sr.'s memory has now been honored with great intention, ensuring that future generations remember the family and the story. Connect and reflect with George Jacobs by listening to the podcast episode, Dan Gagnon on Salem Witch Trials victim George Jacobs Sr. Reading Dan Gagnon's Jacobs article and by visiting his memorial stone at the Rebecca Nurse Homestead.